There you go. Oh, okay, got it. I'll try it again. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Environment Sustainability Committee meeting for Monday, June the 20th, the year 2022. Order of business, call the meeting to order. Item two, declarations of conflict of interest. Adoption of minutes. I have a mover, seconder. Motion carried. Business arising from the minutes. Okay, we'll go to reports and discussions. Uh, just for clarification, item A has been deferred. That's climate change adaption, adaptation, research results. That has been deferred. So we're going to go now to item B. Award of Sustainable Procurement Contract. Katrina, please. Okay, so am I on now? Okay, so we're good? I just need to move it closer. Alrighty. Well, thank you for your patience through that. Um, so this report is to rec uh, recommend the award of a contract for a sustainable procurement consultant. So um, we've been bringing updates on this regularly for the last, well, a little over a year, I would say, the work that's been going on around sustainable procurement with the city, um, which ended up leading us to apply to FCM for funding to hire a consultant to guide our efforts around sustainable procurement. Um, and we were successful in getting that funding in, I believe it was January of this year. And so now we're kind of getting to the point where we're hiring a consultant to do that work. So the work that we're looking to have done, and this is in partnership with the town of Stratford, is the creation of a sustainable procurement action plan for the city and the town of Stratford, as well as associated analyses, training, some tool development for both municipalities. Um, so we went, we put out an RFP for that, the closing date of which was May 16th. Uh, we did receive two submissions, but one was deemed ineligible as it did not uh, fulfill the requirements of the RFP, um, which left us with one eligible submission, which was evaluated and scored by a evaluation committee, um, and it was found to be um, an, a bid that was um, of high quality. It was from Tim Reeve Consulting, Inc., who's based in Vancouver. Um, and Reeve is a group that we have worked with before at the city. So some of you re may remember when we joined the Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement, or the CCSP. So we joined that a couple of years ago, and it's a network of public organizations um, working together to further efforts around sustainable procurement. And Reeve Consulting is the group that facilitates the CCSP. So we've worked with them through that and always had a great experience. Um, they've done some benchmarking with us through that program as well, so they're quite familiar with um, the state of procurement at the city. Um, which is, I think, a really big benefit to working with them. And we did um, contact their references as well, and they received extremely strong references across the board. Um, so you'll see at the bottom of the first page the summary of the evaluation. So they did get a score of 92 um, and ranked first, of course, as they were the only one. Um, the original budget that they proposed was $45,000. That did come in over the amount that had been budgeted for through the funds awarded by FCM and that budgeted for by the Environment and Sustainability Department and Town of Stratford. Um, so the evaluation committee did work in collaboration with Reeve to scale back the project to see how many or how much of that we could trim off. However, it was the opinion of both uh, city and town staff that we couldn't trim it back to the um, originally allocated budget without losing some of the benefits of the project. Um, so we did look around for where we might be able to find additional funds. The, um, the town of Stratford town of Stratford was able to come up with an additional thousand dollars from their budget and the city finance department was able to contribute 8200 um, and the reason for that is that this will form a component of the overall procurement updates that they're undertaking um, we did also contact FCM to see if they could contribute additional funds and they may be able to but we won't know until closer to the end of their fiscal year 
Um, so as a result of all of that, we were able to trim the budget back to $38,000 plus HST um, for a total of 43700 And you can see in the table there where those funds are coming from. So the bulk are from FCM, $19,500. Um, we had already budgeted for 10000 out of the ENS budget, um, and then 8200 from finance, 6000 from the town of Stratford. So it is the recommendation of the selection or the evaluation committee that the sustainable procurement contract be awarded to Tim Reeve Consulting Inc. at a total of $38,000 plus HST and that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee forward the recommendation to finance audit and tendering. Thank you, Katrina. Good presentation. Um, very informative. Uh, open up the floor for any uh, questions, discussions. Sure. I do. Uh, Katrina, just looking at the background there, um, Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement, CCSP, brings together members of the public sector to share knowledge around sustainable public procurement. So it's the focus would be more on net zero green projects. I'm just trying to get my head around like what Sure, yeah, it's quite broad. I mean, that would certainly be one component, but they have various pillars. So there's the environmental pillar that would look at things like um yeah, exactly, like greenhouse gas emissions, but also there's a social component, an indigenous component, um, looking at things like um, fair treatment of workers, that kind of thing. They'd look at waste. There's a lot of different categories that can be looked at in terms of sustainable procurement, but ultimately it's really looking at sustainability from a holistic perspective. So seeing where we can benefit the environment through um, purchasing decisions, benefit um, the community, and um, like from a social perspective, while also taking uh, financial sustainability um, into account as well. So just to follow up, Mr. Chair, so my son who's involved with the property investments in Toronto, ESGs, is environmental uh, social governance, is that part of this public procurement? I mean, it that? certainly could be. Like, it's extremely broad. broad. Okay. Yeah, and okay. part of the purpose of this project is sort of narrowing down where the city should be focusing our efforts and, and where we'll get the most benefit, not only from that environmental social perspective, but where we also may be able to save money as well while doing that at the same time. And Katrina, I know you do a lot of hard work in this, but did we approach Cornwall on it? We did approach Cornwall and, and they were unable to participate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So any other questions, any concerns? Go ahead. Thanks, Katrina. Um, I'm just wondering, Katrina, and I know I asked this when we, when we first passed this. I'm trying to get my head around. Um, potential future costs on top of this. Do we have an idea what it's going to cost the city in the long run? Um, I mean, so that is something that we built into the RFP, was looking at budget implications. So as this work is being done, that's something that council will be kept up to date on right, and okay. all of that. But ultimately, this will set out a roadmap for the types of things we should be doing. But really, these will be decision-making tools that we'll get. So they'll allow us to take more of the sustainability criteria into account when we're making decisions, but it won't have any direct budget implications that we're obligated to. Right. So, so that's what we asked before. So it would come back to council first for any, yeah, yep. any extra costs. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Any other concerns? No. Um, just on the proposed resolution. So the seconder would be the chair of the committee, Donna. I think when it, it's going to finance, it has to go to finance, does it not? So it would be the chair of finance, of, chair of finance would probably be the seconder, I think, is what they would normally do, the chair of this committee and the chair of finance. Right, okay, so you need to make that adjustment on the resolution. Yeah. Secondly, it says on the resolution, 38000 when the uh, price that you're quoting, Katrina, is 43000 correct? That's the tax... Um, thirty-eight thousand is pre-tax, and the forty-three-seven number is okay, so, after taxes. So, would you not put the total amount on the on the resolution? The resolution's forty. It's forty forty-three thousand. 
You don't you don't put the total amount? What? No, I know, but I mean it's right there in in our report. So why would you not put it on the resolution? I think I think most resolutions go like this with the base price plus applicable taxes. Okay. You've got to keep pressing of these buttons. Um, because it says right there on the report forty three thousand seven hundred. Okay. And I don't know if this is eligible to get uh, uh, thank you, Katrina. Back or not. Good uh, as usual, excellent work. Um, I think do we need a motion to forward to finance? Move, Council Bernard. Second by Council Rebard. Motion carried. Uh, item C, cosmetic pesticide update. Before we get into the cosmetic uh, pesticide update, I did receive an email from uh, Councillor Julie McCabe, who uh, wanted this on the agenda, but Julie's not here to participate in the discussions. So um, I'd like to have uh, all members of the committee participate. Uh, what's your thoughts, committee? Mr. Chair, if I could, I I'd like to defer it until Councillor McCabe is here because... It's, as you said, it should be all of committee. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? So we have a full committee? Yeah. yeah. Great. Terry, okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, I guess now we're down to D. Motion on backyard composting. That will be, once again, Katrina. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a report that actually came last month as well, which some of you may remember. Um, we just wanted to get some clarification. We didn't actually end up passing the associated motion. So I just wanted to bring it back in front of you and, and get your thoughts and see if you would be comfortable moving it forward to protective and emergency services. Um, so I'm not sure that everybody was here, so I can give a quick rundown, but basically uh, the Food Council was working on a municipal food policy review to look at where our current policies and bylaws may provide um, barriers to food security in Charlottetown. So one of the areas that they identified was backyard composting. Basically, in the current bylaw, it isn't restricted, but it isn't um, specifically enabled either, and there is some language um, indicating that the preferred method um, or even the required method for the disposal of compost is through the IWMC bins. So it's the recommendation of the Food Council that the nuisance bylaw, where that language is located, is amended to more explicitly protect backyard composting. So they've drawn a lot of their research from the province's Environmental Protection Act. So the recommendation is that um, we bring the nuisance bylaw more in line with that. So we add in a definition of backyard composting, um, as well as amend the relevant section of the nuisance bylaw to state that there is an exception for backyard composting from the current language. So where it currently says that the IWMC containers must be used, it says that this does not apply to composting. Then they also recommend that another subsection be added um, that stipulates some of the requirements around backyard composting um, so that it must be a minimum of five meters from adjacent dwellings, that it must not create offensive odors, and it must not attract pests. Um, so that's basically what they're asking. They have consulted with the bylaw enforcement officer um, and have his support on this. They also want to note that any concerns that would arise through this bylaw also could be addressed through the dangerous hazardous and unsightly premises bylaw for enforcement. Um, I know last time when we discussed this that there was a lot of talk around ed needed education as this comes in and, and I would fully agree and support that and have discussed that further with the Food Council and they're also um, fully in agreement um, but the thought being that it would make sense to send it to protective and emergency services and have them weigh in on what anything like that may look like. So for today we're recommending and seeking your support in forwarding this on to the protective and emergency services committee. Thank you Katrina. Councilor Bernard. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks Katrina. I'm, I'm glad you talked to the bylaw officer. Uh, bring Todd up to date. 
Um, the only thing that I would like to see, and I noticed in here that talked about uh, containers, but it also talked about having your compost pile in the open. And so there could be at least five meters from the next door neighbor's yard from the open end of it. I thought most people that did this always had it in containers. Uh, yeah, certainly it would be in containers. Yep. Okay, so you can't just have an open compost because what I read in here was it sounded like you could. Uh, Which part are you referring to? Or pile, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so generally it would be in a container, I think, in the city. Um, if that was something you were concerned about, we could, we could take a look at that particular part of the recommendation. I, I would recommend that the pile comes out. It has to be in a container. Yep. Okay, thank you. You can look at that for, for sure. But Mr. Chair, just in a follow-up on that. Yep, go with ahead. Katrina, with compost posting, I thought if we're looking at a container, does, are you not allowed, are you not, how can I put it? Is it not best to leave it open so that the air can get in and help with the decom decomposition, uh, decom uh, decomposing? Can um, yeah, not, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on composting no. techniques, but I do know that generally the containers do have a lid on them, but they're built in such a way that the air can get in and so that they're breathable. Um, to my knowledge, um, there certainly are like compost containers that people use that don't have a lid. Um, that's not generally what I've seen in the city. I mean, that does tend to lend itself to um, like and rodent problems and, and odors potentially. Yeah. Um, but and Mr. Chair, so if we're looking at a container, Mr. Chair, so when we're looking at a container that is enclosed, then do we have to provide the specs? Are we getting into the details that much? Well, I can tell you my neighbor has one. It's a compost container. Yeah. It does have a lid on it. It does have open open for air to get at it. It does compost without giving off any odor. But it's a compost container for composting. I, I think that, oh. Just to, on the note of the container, we don't want to get into a situation where it's like cost prohibitive for people and they would have to purchase a container. You can do backyard composting in a contained area without it being within a container. So I think we would want to be careful on that language. I know what you're saying about the pile, Council Bernard, like we don't just want an open pile in someone's backyard without any, you know, any sort of you know, defined space that that composting is happening, but lots of people would make sort of a, like a fenced area and put their compost in it, or they would not use, like some people certainly use a container, but they can be kind of expensive. So it would be nice to find an option that, that remove the idea of like an unkempt pile in the middle of a backyard um, but didn't necessarily hold people to put it in specifically like a drum or a closed unit. And, and that's a good point, uh, Ramona, because uh, the first time I get into composting when, when I was with Katimovic at West and we were in, all groups were promoted to uh, push composting, but it was an open, an open system to allow the air in. And I understand uh, Councillor Bernard's uh, concern, and I'm concerned about it too, but yeah, we don't we don't want to make it cost prohibitive to get people into uh, composting because composting to me is very important not just for someone's garden but also that it takes that much more waste or compost away from pickup by IWMC and I think Mr. Chair at the Desbrise Park do they not have an open compo uh, compost Mr. Chair I think they do. Do you know what? Um, I'm going to have to check that. I, Can you, I believe they do, but I don't want to say for sure. Uh, so uh, I'd have to uh, yeah. discuss that with the participants. I'm a big promoter of it, Mr. Chair. That yeah. and, I, and again, I, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm a big proponent too. Yeah. But but I think there's got to be. Uh, you can help me here, Ramon. There's got to be a standard too. Uh, we want to make sure that it that it's uh, neighborhood friendly. It's got to be neighborhood friendly. The last thing we want is our you know, the bylaw enforcement officer out there, and well, this, they're not abiding, our neighbors are not abiding by the rules. We understand good intentions, but we're, you know, we're, we're experiencing the, 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 you know, the fallout. And the, somewhere along the line, there's got to be a happy medium here where there's, 
respect for the adjacent property owner and everything is truly copacetic. So there's got to be there's got to be some kind of a standard. Did we do a jurisdictional scan? Uh, yes, the Food Council looked at what many other municipalities are requiring, and that was what led them to recommend the regulations that they are. So a fair bit of research was done behind these recommendations. Okay, yep. okay. Um, and I know you have did some collaboration with the bylaw enforcement officer. Does this have to be, Donna, maybe you can help me, does this have to be vetted through Protective Services Committee because bylaw enforcement is under, uh, under, protective, uh, under protective services? I think it's more that the nuisance bylaw is under protective services as opposed to the person or, or position. It's a nuisance but, bylaw, which is where the amendments would be made. Under here yep. or or no, no protective services. So it does go to so it yep. goes from here That's to protective services. Then to council. Then to council. Yep. Okay. So it hasn't gone there yet. No. Okay. It comes here first and then it goes. Okay. No, that's fine. Just trying to understand the uh, procedure. And Any other questions? Yep. Go I, ahead. I would like to re reiterate, and I, I agree with what you're saying, Mr. Chair. I think. <coughs> The idea is great, but to have the open piles could create a problem and it could make it difficult for the bylaw officer when somebody needs to go and check in on an open pile and somebody just said, well, I'll, that's my compost pile. I, the, 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 the compost bins that I've seen yeah. don't look to me like they're overly expensive. They're just a plastic bin. So I, I'm going by my neighbors. I haven't seen a lot of them, but I mean, he's run, been running his for a while and it's, it's been working, working great. And I assume to have that then then a pile in somebody's backyard that attracts rodents and everything else would run into that issue. So to me, I'm okay with all this, but I'd like to have it in the container. Katrina, can you get us uh, send the, the committee members a, uh, a photo of what the containers look like and and what the cost would be? Um, yeah, I certainly can. I mean, there's many different options, but I can I can find some options for you. There are a lot. The other thing I would add to Ramona's comment about the containers is even barring like a, an open pile, it is possible to make your own. So I, I would second the concerns about being too prohibitive on what we require because, um, I mean, we can certainly look at, at removing language like the word pile, but also in terms of prescribing what has to be purchased. I mean, I know they don't look very expensive. Um, I do. I don't know exactly how much they are, but I know they're more than you would think. Um, and, and there are a lot of sort of do-it-yourself options that, that can function quite well. Um, but I can look into options and send them around, certainly. Thank you, Katrina. So with that in mind, we still have a little more work to do. Are we ready to, with, with the work that your uh, other work that needs to be done in terms of uh, looking at those options, do we uh, bring it back to the committee, maybe send it out by email to make sure all committee members are ready and then we send it on to Protective Services? I think the changes she wanted to make yeah, they're fine, only that we wanted to add that it's in the container. That's the only change. So I think we have to confirm that. Okay, you want to put a motion on the floor? Uh, sure, I'll put a motion on the floor. That, that, that her, her changes, uh, I, my, my concern would be that the changes that we're going to make in the nuisance bylaw yeah. under the compost, that the compost is in containers, not piles. Okay. Yeah. Unless the pile is enclosed. But it needs to be under control. Okay, okay, do I have a seconder to make yep. that amendment? Can we just clarify an enclosed pile? Do you mean like has to have a top on it or if it was a f like a fenced bin with open top? Would that work if it was? Okay. I think my only concern would be if we make amendments to this and actually make it more prohibitive for composting, backyard composting, as a result of how if saying it, only composting can happen in a pile. If we've been silent on it up until this point, then we could actually make it like less, like people less able to backyard compost. Yeah, the only thing about Ramona is, you know, we, we can go real easy and then we run into problems that we have to yeah. deal with. No, absolutely. I just, and, I just mean, me, would you consider like a, an enclosed pile in that it's, or maybe it contained, like we can look at some of the yes. language and send it out. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're looking for, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be good, Ramona. I'm concerned too because of the, you know, particularly, you know, some areas of the city where there's high density and the properties are practically right on top of one another. Uh, you know, there's other challenges that, that I have to deal with. So, uh, 
I, I think it'd be advantageous if we just explore those options. Yeah. So, so Mr. Slee, particularly in, in the in the high density areas where properties are practically right on top of one another. Narrow lots. Yeah. Well, narrow lots. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, <laughs> composting um, is requires work. It just you don't throw your food waste into a container. It there's a lot of there are steps to it. So anyone that gets into composting, uh, they have to ensure that they are. Uh, maintaining it and I think that maintenance would be to keep it contained and I think Councillor Bernard is more concerned about it being topped off like with a top on it correct that's right is that right you're more concerned that, it, that there's a cover on it not really no I'm more concerned that I, I, when it's in the container it's confined you know where it is and if it's in a, an open pile that's fenced off that's fine but I have too many home parks that they don't have much room. No, no. I have a bunch of narrow lots as in other communities, so those lots aren't very wide. So, you know, do we want to have some people that may want to start a compost pile and it doesn't really work out and they just leave it? Or do we want to have it somewhat under control? So if it's fenced off, then it's, it's probably not going to be an issue. If, if it has odor, then we get the bylaws to check it out. If it's in the yeah. container, the same thing. And, and Ramona, I, Mr. Chair, again, I don't think that requires it's stepping outside of what's practice already now, common practice for composting. I think what he's saying is already there. It's just that we're going to formalize it in the in the bylaw. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we can make that we can make that clear. And and do note that there is a B and C, so it has to also not create any offensive odors, and it has to also not um, attract pets. So the bylaw and officer will have that as a tool that they can use. If it's somebody has a pile and it's attracting pests or if it's smelling then and it's not located far from their neighbors, then they will still have those that authority to weigh in. Yes, uh, you know, the, the trailer parks are an excellent example of, uh, you know, these, they're, they're practically on top of one another. They're that, they're very close and you could uh, make the, draw the same analogy with, uh, with some of the properties in the downtown that are very close. In fact, there's no space between them. And then you get into these small backyards and uh, there's there's challenges. There's challenges there now. Yeah. So, you know, what we're looking for here is a win-win for, for everyone. And, and Mr. Chair, just to conclude, uh, in the summertime, in the downtown, the 500 lots, when the green bins are out and it's hot out and uh, residents put uh, seafood shells in those compost it is it's quite an odor so I can understand that these composts would be in a, a different situation but I'm we're all supporting it and we'll just look at the the amendments or how we're going to clean up the bylaw thank you sir okay with that in mind uh, Ramona there's going to be some more work done then you're going to send that information out to members of the committee and then when we're ready to sign off, we'll forward it on to uh, Mr. Rivera's committee. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, high school transit project final report, Ramona. Great. So I just wanted to share this to you. So this is a program that we've run over the last number of years um, in our Charlottetown schools. Let me just get to this page here. And we've come to the end of the program, so we just kind of wanted to share some of the overall results of it. So as you may or may not know, the province of PEI announced in March this year that they would be subsidizing transit fares for all youth 18 and under. Um, at that, Before that, it used to be under 5 was free, um, 12 and under was a dollar, and 18, 12 to 18 was a regular fare. So this was a program we put in place during that period of time in order to try to encourage more high school students to choose transit over maybe driving their own vehicle or choose transit some of the times. And we went into the high school, worked with high school students um, and developed a program with them. Um, we developed some um, informational videos targeted to high schoolers and we had they had a specific pass that they used which enabled, uh, enabled us to track their usage of the system. Uh, shoot, this would have should have been in 
scan and color, but um, you can see some of the information in the report in terms of the number of students that we had in the program and where they lived throughout the city, some of the reasons why they chose to use transit, and how the program grew over the years um, that we had it in place. So we started out in 2019 um, with 53 students and we ended at 301 students for this school year and that's for Charlottetown Rural and Colonel Gray. So wanted to share that with you. I think it was a program that did really well at engaging uh, youth at, to become future transit users. And we hope also that the PEI's program to get more youth on the bus will have a similar effect. And yeah, if there's any questions on the report, I can answer them. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ramona. A uh, couple of things. Um, one, I don't know if this is your last meeting or next month, your last meeting, but... Uh, it's, it, I'm not quite sure if I'll make the next one yeah. or not, but... So that, I want to say what, what a fantastic job you've done while you're here. You've Thank really you. grown the uh, Environment Sustainability Committee, done a fantastic job. So I want to recognize you for that. You, you will be missed. Yeah, thanks, Harry. The other thing is it, it, it's a little annoying to find out that we've had $180,000 from the provincial government for our transit system for at least 10 years. And it would look like the expectations in the budget where we were hoping to have 400, a little over 400,000. I think 435 was the figure, but it was over 400,000. And to find out now that they're reneging on it, it's really disappointing. To go and, and make these announcements and, and then leave us with the, the same dollars that we've had for 10 years that the transit system has grown so rapidly and to, to let our staff know that, sorry, that's, although it sounded good, we don't have the money. It's pretty disheartening, I have to say, it's at least. So, well, thank you, uh, Councilor Barrett. I think, uh, with that said, I would propose uh, that uh, I would propose that uh, maybe uh, myself or Ramona meet with the minister to see if we can uh, uh, have them have a change of heart, uh, bring in all the background information what's happened over the last 10 years and the, uh, the the expectation that we had as a, as a city government moving we get into the transit business in full force with the with the idea that the province would be a, a partner, uh, a, you know, a partner. Uh, we, we, we just can't uh, go it alone. <clears throat> and, uh, and It's restricting our budget because I think the expectation is where we were getting some money and we were getting around that. Now that extra money has to be found within the budget. So that's difficult. That puts a lot of pressure on the... Uh, on, on, on the city because you know the, the, the city's growing there's more development taking place there's uh, people in the community that that are wanting the routes to be expanded uh, uh, you know the, the, they, they see the, 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 the work in progress over the last number of years and uh, although it's still relatively young um, there's an expectation when people come to our city in terms of uh, transportation, and if we're going to be truly uh, a sustainable uh, community, then uh, we have to meet these standards. So, so uh, Ramona, maybe we can reach out to the minister, and you and I can have a meeting with the minister and his officials. And you may you may want to take you may want to take the mayor too. Did you say take the mayor? Oh, you may want to. Yeah. But I mean, it's not a bad idea to get out and meet yeah. anyway. I mean, I think the consultations have been going on and. Uh, I think the department head got the, got the announcement probably uh, a couple weeks ago. When it comes to elected officials, elected officials should meet with elected officials. Mr. Chair, if, if we can just get back to the report, um, the numbers are, look quite good there. But Ramona, could I just ask a couple of questions? If you look at where students live, West Royalty, so you're telling me that large circle indicates a lot of students from West Royalty were using the free transit? Yes. Wow. East Royalty, I know that we poured money into East Royalty to make it more available, but the the indication, it, it didn't draw what we thought it would draw. 
Is that correct to say? Well, these numbers, Your Worship, are reflective of the total amount. Yeah. So of the of all the rides that were taken, the largest proportion were students in West Royalty and wow. Stratford, and less so in East Royalty. But it could be that we had fewer students sign up in that area. It doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't as engaged in the transit oh, use. Oh, I'm not saying that. Yeah. It's just I think we, we, we did go with the same uh, call out to the whole city that this was a option for students to take. Yeah. And I, I'm really impressed by, you know, the numbers. Um, I know you break it down by age. I know with Colonel Gray, if you look at the ethnic background of uh, Colonel Gray, I think last count there were about 90 um, nationalities. We didn't get that breakdown on uh, ethnic background. It was just age and where they were coming from, correct? Yes, we didn't take any um, like ethnic Other. background demographic. No. Okay. And could could I ask why we didn't have Cornwall in, in, in part of that, or do we? Because so, Cornwall's high school is at Bluefield. Bluefield, correct. Yeah. correct. So they were aware of the program and knew what we were aiming to do, but the focus um, was on Colonel Gray and uh, Charlottetown Rural. Yeah. And then your destinations, again, Confederation Center, Charlottetown Mall were the big catchment areas for destinations. Anyways, good numbers, and uh, looks like the province agreed with the city by extending that uh, free pass by saying, look, start riding the bus. It's cheaper, and it's much more uh, envi uh, environmentally friendly. Thank you. Thank you, Yerusha. Any wow. other uh Questions or concerns regarding the high school transit project? No? I'll have, I'll have one. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Ramona, was there any type of feedback that you can give us uh, to the reasons why it'd be higher in one area than the other? Or was it, was it relatively pretty even all the way around? Or, or do we notice a significant difference? Uh, we could certainly, we have a lot of raw data too, so we could ask that question of the of the survey results and see what it tells us. There's certainly, uh, like some areas of the city have obviously better coverage than others, so that could be influencing that, but we can, that, yeah. we can find that information in terms of if there were students specifically in, in areas of town that had trouble accessing either the service didn't come to them or it didn't come at the hours that they needed. So we can find that out and, and report back. Yeah, what I hear As we know, uh, especially uh, across from Lucy Mod School, that whole 155 acres is developing rapidly. Uh, so we have some more subdivisions that are that are on the drawing board to be developed. And so it'd be nice to have that information. We can kind of look at it and see uh, for the future. See if there's a, a run we went with the we may want to do out towards East Road in the newer subdivision areas. So I think right now, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of, uh... you can't hear me? I can hear. You're only the two mics on. Anyway, um, it's just to give us an idea uh, where there may be some lapses, where there's maybe some areas that we could be adding to the transit that a lot of these students could be using that don't have access to it. So. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, can I just make one one more point, Ramona? When the for the data collection with the province, do you think they'll continue to collect data? Uh, maybe not. Like, could no. we ask them to look at specifically at Charlottetown, uh, the capital region, Stratford, Cornwall, and uh, and and Charlottetown? So T3 does track um, youth riders, so we have that in our monthly statement from them. Good. Um, but we wouldn't be able, it's not broken down by age group or anything. Uh, once we get all the buses with the updated fare boxes on them, we do have the option of using transit cards, and that can track your age and where you're going, and we can get, collect a lot more data that way. But we're still kind of, some of the buses are done and some aren't, so it'll take us a little while before we'll be modernized on all of them. And, and Mr. Chair, if you just notice on page two, gender breakdown, 66% of riders were women. Interesting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, one other thing I want to say was uh, it's been a great benefit for the, the youth group in Hillsborough Park. Now that it's free for under 18, it, it allows these, uh, the supervisors up there to uh, be able to take the kids on a lot more field trips, go to a lot more, whether it's uh, Victoria Park or whether it's at cinemas or whether, whether, uh, whatever the field trip is. It's been able to uh, do it cost efficiently for sure. I mean, they were always good to give us a reduction in the fees to take the youth kids, but now that it's free, there, there's a lot more trips being able to plan, and then you'd be surprised the uh, amount of kids that don't get to go to a lot of places where this transit will take them. So it's it's been a blessing that way. So uh, thanks. Okay. Any other further questions, concerns, discussions? No. Move for adjournment. No, just, just for new business. I just wanted to mention one uh, one note. Uh, Jessica, who was responsible for the uh, bike friendly block party a huge success jessica did you get a count was it 70 people do you think or what do you think i think that's a pretty good estimate we didn't do a count it was so spread out in the right. area it was hard to to tell but i would say 70 or 80 people and lots of families and it was a great impact and i listened to mitch under hayes presentation on how to break down the barriers about cycling and uh he had some very interesting uh, groups there that asked a lot of questions, like the green being good to go, red, what's stopping, so any person or residents that want to get into cycling. But again, big thanks to Jessica and, and the team. Mitch, Mitch Underhay, I know that uh, Frank McCackwin was out there uh, uh, pushing his e-bikes. He had the uh, booth th there to promote uh, the e-bikes. So all is good, and hopefully we have our for e-bikes ordered, uh, Ramona? Uh, we do. We just put out the RFQ, so that we should have our bids back in the next couple weeks on the e-bikes. So that'll be a fun addition to our fleet. And just on that, uh, I just realized yesterday it's a $500 rebate. So Definitely. That helps with the price. I'll be looking to get one. Oh, yeah. No, they're great. I, I used uh, an e-bike for the, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Mayor and Council uh, Ride around the park it was great. Yeah. Mr. Chair, can I can I just add something as well? Um, sure. I forgot to mention that this is actually Jessica Brown's last committee meeting, so Jessica will be moving on to a new adventure, and uh, Katrina will be acting in the sustainability officer position. You're saying, Katrina? For now? <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a mass exit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Jessica. Ex excellent work. Uh, we made some big inroads, and uh, we'll continue on with the progress and try to build on uh, all the good work that you have uh, that you've done here, and uh, it's paid huge dividends. And uh, hope you'll come back soon. <laughs> thank you. Vote for adjournment. Thank you, sir. Motion.